I want you all to say hello to the pouched lamprey. He's got a cool bag under his eye to hold rocks, an insatiable lust for fish blood, and a ring of teeth like a miniature sarlacc. But probably the most magnificent aspect of this terrifying worm fish is its color vision, which at least on the surface is better than yours. That's because this creature, a real living fossil largely unchanged from the ancestor that gave rise to all reptiles, birds, mammals, you and me, has tetrachromatic super color vision. Compared to this guy, all humans are colorblind. Then why did mammals ditch their super color vision for mediocre color vision? Today on Chromophobe, we'll be looking at part two of this series on the evolution of color vision, the nocturnal bottleneck. In part one, we traced back the first appearance of color vision in our ancestors by using phylogenetics in the fossil record. I recommend watching part one, but it's not strictly necessary for understanding this video as long as you generally know what opsins are and what they do. So let's reset the stage to about 500 million years ago. The common ancestor of all vertebrates, something very similar to this modern lamprey, has just evolved complex image-forming eyes. Even more impressive, it has photoreceptors featuring the four opsins that would give them, and the vast majority of their descendants, tetrachromatic color vision. For the next half billion years, this organism would then go on to evolve into fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. But this arrangement of four opsins, the so-called cone complement, stayed amazingly stable. Almost every descendant would inherit these same four cone opsins. Sure, they'd make tweaks along the way to tune the opsin sensitivities to their habitat, but otherwise leave well enough alone and preserve that gift of color vision. Hell, even the move from water to land did not affect our ancestors' cone complement. Only in incredibly rare cases would an animal ever think that four was not enough and evolve a fifth opsin class, but losing one of the four opsin classes altogether is surprisingly common, occurring in snakes, sharks, and important for this video, mammals. Of the four cone opsins that were available to our lamprey-like ancestors, our later mammalian ancestors would first lose this opsin gene, and then that opsin gene. As a result, mammals are typically dichromats, a name which references our two remaining cone opsins. This is in addition to our RH1 rod opsin that doesn't contribute to color vision, so we're not talking about it. But why would mammals lose what many consider to be objectively better vision, so much so that so many different mammals would later re-evolve trichromacy. For most other vertebrates, including our ancestors, modern birds, etc., there was or is a selective evolutionary pressure where the environment essentially rewards tetrachromatic color vision with higher reproduction rates. This is the basis of natural selection. For example, most birds rely on color to find mates, a task that would generally be more difficult for trichromatic birds. This pressure is not only required for the original evolution of tetrachromatic vision, but also for retaining it. In the simplest sense, genes follow a use it or lose it principle. If there is no selective pressure for a gene, it will eventually accumulate enough mutations that it falls into disrepair and then disappears. There needs to be selective pressure that weeds these mutated genes out of the gene pool. Otherwise, you will eventually lose the functional genes. The most common way to relax the evolutionary pressure for color vision is for a species to transition to an environment where light is not bright enough to excite their cones. Because if you're not using your cones, you're losing them. This applies to deep sea, nocturnal, cave dwelling, or burrowing animals, any habitat where there is little light. Just look at the burrowing blind mole rats, whose mammalian ancestors were also tetrachromatic, but have not only lost the opsins necessary for color vision, but have also lost their vision entirely as their eyelids have fused together and eyes atrophied to almost nothing. Many examples of cave-dwelling salamanders and fish have also completely lost their eyes so quickly, in fact, that they can still otherwise breed with the surfius variants of their species because essentially everything needed for reproduction between the two, which excludes the eyes, is still perfectly compatible. In the deep sea, below a thousand meters depth, there is virtually no surface light at all. Many of these fish in the so-called midnight zone do lose their eyes, such as the cruelly named flabby whale fish. However, many of them retain their eyes and their vision if they needed to recognize bioluminescence, like this hungry little fella, just chasing after some glowy food. Oh, well, I guess he also would have been better off without eyes. 
If we ascend from the midnight zone into the twilight zone of the ocean, around 200 meters, where very small amounts of sunlight penetrate, most animals here have actually found it useful to keep their eyes. However, in both of these cases of these, of these deep sea fish who have kept their eyes, they typically lost their cones, which just are not sensitive enough to be useful in those dim conditions. Instead, they rely exclusively on their rods to enable their more sensitive scotopic vision. This means that the fish that can see most likely cannot see color. A little higher in the ocean as we move into the sunlight zone, maybe around 50 meters. There is enough light to excite cones, but that light is still quite monochromatic. Ocean water is simply much better at letting blue light pass through than other wavelengths. If we look at this graph, which shows how deep certain colors of light can travel underwater, red light can only penetrate to about 10 meters, while blue light can penetrate to almost 200. Take a look at this color palette as it descends from the surface to a depth of 50 meters. After a while, the red target turns black because there is simply no more red sunlight for it to reflect back at the camera. This means that the deeper you go in the ocean, the narrower the band of visible light and the less colorful the habitat can be. So even when cone-driven photopic vision is possible at 50 to 100 meters since the light is still bright enough for cones to function, fewer cones are required to experience the less complex colors at this depth. As a result, these fish tend to have only one or two cones instead of the four that their shallow water counterparts have. Actually, in essentially all families of fish, the deeper a given species lies in the ocean, the fewer cones they tend to have, meaning less light equals fewer options. So let's get back to the mammals. What happened to our mammalian ancestors that made them lose half of their cone options? Did they spend a few millennia chilling in the deep sea while they waited for their options to mutate away? That would make this video way more interesting, but it was actually the nocturnal bottleneck. 315 million years ago, our mammalian ancestors diverged from the dinosaurs' ancestors. The proto-mammalians couldn't directly compete with the proto-dinosaurs, so evolution took a different tack. By 250 million years ago, they evolved to be warm-blooded. This step was probably primarily to avoid parasitic fungi, but not requiring the constant warmth of the sun had a useful side effect. It allowed them to nope out of that dangerous daytime role as readily available appetizers for dinosaurs and quickly fill a niche as small nocturnal insectivores. It's kind of like when I became nocturnal as a 16 year old to avoid seeing my parents, but my phase only lasted two years. Mammals spent over a hundred million years as nocturnal, during which they adapted many traits that benefited this nocturnal lifestyle, such as rod-dominant retinas and reflective tapetums, both of which increase their eyes' sensitivity to the dim, scotopic nighttime environment. Since they rarely, if ever, needed to use their eyes in daylight, the cones became useless, and eventually they lost two of their cone ops and genes as described earlier. And it wasn't just the two cone options either. Mammals lost all sorts of features that help birds, fish, and reptiles detect a richer color spectrum. We lost the elaborate system of colored oil droplets that pre-filter and tweak light color before it hits the opsins. We lost about two-thirds of the non-visual opsins that have various light detecting tasks in the body. We lost double cones, where pairs of cones directly communicate with each other in a way that we do not even understand. It's no wonder then that mammals are routinely described as having impoverished color vision. Lisa, I want some more. Color! One commenter on the first evolution video claimed that they wanted to slap that ancestor animal that got rid of its tetrachromatic vision. This is certainly a relatable feeling for most colorblind people, but it's maybe disingenuous to think of them as some deadbeat animal who lost their options because they couldn't keep up with the payments or something. Much more likely, they were better off without them. Meaning that there was not only a neutral evolutionary pressure, but a negative evolutionary pressure, pushing them to ditch the opsins. In life, nothing is free. And this includes your body parts. Think back to the blind mole rat. They didn't lose their eyes simply because they didn't need them. After all, this guy's clearly on the surface. But because keeping them was a lot of wasted energy in their development and their maintenance, plus, Eyes are also a big infection risk when you are literally using your teeth to burrow through dirt. Likewise, color vision is not free. 
there are so many sacrifices that a visual system makes to be able to see color. First, more cone types means lower visual acuity, since the pixels in your eye essentially become larger to hold four cones instead of just one. Second, to calculate color, your eye needs some intermediate cells between the photoreceptors and the optic nerve to compare those signals from multiple photoreceptors. This slows down the propagation of visual information from the eye to the brain. Third, those intermediate cells can also add noise at each step, decreasing the dynamic range of your vision. Fourth, more types of cones generally means more cones. More cones means less space for rods, and less rods means worse scotopic dim light vision. Dark adapted animals like the tarsier or the giant squid tend to evolve giant eyeballs to collect as many precious photons as possible. Clearly there is a limit to your eye size, so they also have to allocate as much of the available retinal real estate to rods. To them, any photon caught by a cone is a waste, so they minimize both the cones and the cone types to be able to see in dimmer and dimmer light. So all else equal, when compared to a tetrachromat, a monochromat or even a dichromat could essentially have higher visual resolution, better contrast sensitivity, faster reaction to vision, and stronger night vision. With all of those advantages, higher, better, faster, stronger, maybe the more appropriate question is, why would you keep your color vision? After the KT extinction 66 million years ago, many mammals proliferated to refill the daytime niche left vacant by the now extinct dinosaurs. So did their new habitat cause them to re-evolve the options required for tetrachromatic color vision? In the words of Bon Jovi, whoa, we're halfway there. In the next video on the series, we will look at how primates re-evolved trichromacy and why color blindness was a necessary side effect. This is Chromophobe. Whoa, we're halfway there. Whoa, vision is unfair. Take my eyes, I need a new pair. Whoa, living in despair. Living when this, uh. Color vision, man.